to me, like lifting heavy just changes the way that you're gonna have a strategy with things. You know, something like a depth jump at body weight is training your rebound, like your quickness. Whereas some people then load it, but invariably, as soon as you load it, you're now changing the strategy because it's loaded, it's gonna be slower. Worried sounds strong, but I'd be considerate of the neurological implications for youth kids in lifting. Hey guys, before we get to this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about an exciting development at Evolve Move Play. So we are bringing back our two-day traveling workshops. So that means one of our workshops might be coming out to a city near you, or potentially you could reach out to us and bring us to a city near you. We did this for years. I started, when I started Evolve Move Play, I taught traveling workshops all over the world from 2013 to 2019. But after the birth of my youngest daughter, I needed to stay home more with my wife and my three kids. And so we stopped those. But now we have a really amazing staff of teachers who've come up with me through the retreats of the last few years. And I myself have a little bit more freedom to travel. So we've got four upcoming dates here in the States and two dates in Europe coming up where you can come and train with us for just two days. That means it's going to be a lot easier entry point as far as cost and logistics for you to come and join us. So check out what's going on with our two-day workshops in the link down below. And we look forward to seeing you in the city near you soon. Clifton, welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. It's good to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. You're someone who I've thought about having on the podcast for a long time. And I was thinking about it after I invited you on. I, the reason that I, I've had trouble like being like, okay, let's get Cliff on is because I can't define exactly what you are and what your sort of like space in the industry is. Um, <laughs> I can see you nodding on. Yeah, I agree. It's a, I, so many people have a very clear signature as to what it is that they've gone full bore into mm -hmm. their niche, as, yeah. as we like to say. And I don't really have one. I, I think at this point, it would have to be education, fitness education. Yeah. Um, because that's been the through line since 2011, mm -hmm. um, traveling and teaching certifications, workshops, lecturing, that type of thing. And, and I guess managerial man, it like, honestly, at this point, the number one job function that I've had since 2004 at Trader Joe's is managing I, funny enough, like, you know, managing, managing Trader Joe's and managing, um, managing the move nat stuff for a while there and then managing uh fit wall for seven and a half years and now managing pain-free performance so there's there's a lot of actually businessy stuff that i've been doing um that's centered around different avenues in fitness and and i guess and i'm saying this right now discovering it myself that perhaps that's my thing is <laughs> managing around fitness and being some being somewhat adaptable there yeah so you just to, to kind of dig in I, th I think talking about the business side it's going to be interesting because i'm sure we have lots of uh fit pros who could use some insight on to what the hell management is and operations in a <laughs> this industry most of us are dumbasses in that way but uh but let's let's dig into your your background a little bit so you you mentioned move that you taught a lot of uh seminars for move and then you've also worked with animal flow worked with a fit wall worked with um uh, pain-free performance. Uh, I know you work with, uh, Jason C. Brown's kettlebell stuff as well. I can't remember what the name of that company is. Kettlebell athletics, kettlebell athletics. Um, what am I missing? I feel like there's more, more in this interesting part. <laughs> those, those were the things that I've taught a lot for. I've done a couple Spartan group obstacle, uh, race course specialist things. I've taught a couple assisted i should say at a couple fms ck fms's okay um i've done my own workshop series for my old company ba training um you know, invite i've done consulting at various uh larger group fitness studios about workout writing or actually written months of their programming for them at a time um mm -hmm. as a as a contracted offer so yeah, you know, I've done personal, I was doing online training in 2011, um, when you didn't have train heroic or trainerize or anything that's useful to use, it's all spreadsheets. So I've, I've worked in a big box gym. I have my own business in my backyard kettlebell booty camp. Um, 
did the personal training in the parks. So I've, I've dabbled. I, I mean, at this point, we're old enough that it hasn't been dabbling. It's been, I've worked in each of these different avenues and uh, which has given me quite a good perspective on the fitness industry as a whole, having worked through these different disciplines as what I like to call romantic, uh, as MoveNet is, and as practical as group fitness is. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty wide spectrum, which I think gives me a pretty interesting perspective on you know, like where different things probably fit in as far as commercial viability. Um, and yeah, man, it's been, it's been a hell of a weird ride. That's for sure. Uh, (laughs) uh, I'll use an anecdote. At some point I got to remember to you get mentioned in every workshop that I teach (laughs) because, uh, because I steal, I stole something from you, which I think you borrowed from somebody anyway. Um, when you were on the Just Fly podcast, you mentioned the callous analogy oh. from Katie, right? Oh, yeah. And and I'm like, God, oh, it's just it's just so good mm-hmm. of a of an analogy to use. But uh, it's funny because you know from the I invariably get asked at any cert that I'm at, what else should you be checking out? And I still have this um, very over not overwhelming, but you know, big piece of what I do is exploration of movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you get the recommendation for the as explorative as you can be, (laughs) because you can only be so explorative within the gym, I think. And eventually, if you want to explore more, you got to do something like one of your things. Yeah, absolutely. Go out, do exploratory locomotor play in nature. That's that's what we think about it as. Yeah, exactly. So um i think a couple things that have made me particularly enjoy your content recently is one that like old dude who's been around the industry for a long time and has a certain fun sense of humor about it and then also like all the exploration that you've been doing around like kettlebells and how to actually use them as athletic tools and then obviously trying to dunk as a 40 year old six foot white guy um you know i'm on that train too i feel you (laughs) <laughs> with big meniscal tears that you know have not 11 millimeter on the left knee on the medial side mm. uh so man- managing that managing a hole in the head of my femur on the right side from hardcore parker no it was actually from a sumo deadlift um mm. that i that i bruised the head of the the medial condyle of the femur and it still gives me issues every so often Ouch. that was that was 11 years ago that one had surgery <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, so the, the kettlebell, so it's funny that I work with Jason with the term. Let's, actually, let's come back to the kettlebell. I, I want to yep. come back to that. But before we do that, you said something about practical versus romantic. And I was curious about how you're conceptualizing that. Because like, I wouldn't think of a group fitness class necessarily as like the preeminent of practical. So how do you, how do you use that language? And and how so do you I, applying to people's training? I mean it from a business application standpoint. Okay. And I started thinking about the, about with regards to move that I used to say, this is a kind of a romantic concept that I should just drive into the park, walk into the woods and then solve movement problems exploratively. Yeah. And it's absolutely fun and it's absolutely enjoyable. And I think really, really um, not just engaging, but rewarding when you have when you solve problems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, also, like, hey, what muscle are you working? I don't know, all of them. It, it, there's so many tangible benefits. So there are practical benefits to it. However, the practicality in what is a busy lifestyle for most people is what's missing. Yeah. Okay, now I'm all scratched up on my arms, my legs. Oh, shit, I fell on a tree. I hurt myself. How do I get out of here? Am I allowed to do it at this park or am i going to get called by the police because it's weird to have an adult on the playground um am i good enough to do it safely have i had the the coaching with it so that's the from practicality what i mean is group fitness is i know where i'm going to park my car i go in they have water i have a towel i have a shower it's in and out in 40 minutes so the practicality is strictly from a like a commercial business setting Mm -hmm. that was what i meant by romantic versus practical Mm -hmm. however um, it's it's not romantic to from a 
efficacy of results standpoint, it's fantastic. And in, in that way, you could argue that it's certainly more practical than the group fitness. So I, that was with my um, managerial, like, how do I sell this shit <laughs> app being on? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Have you, uh, have you run into Frank Francis's work? I, I have. And I, I mean, it's been years, but I was uh, very engaged in Frank's stuff uh, via Jason Brown, who's a big fan. And then also when I was more in the, in the move nat realm of things. Yeah. It's interesting because in that, in that book, the exuberant animal by Frank, he talks about romantic versus classical as approaches to training. It's classical is something like, you know, sets and reps and, you know, machines and trying to get everything as tightly dialed. Like you're treating the body as a machine, whereas romantic would be more feeling what needs to happen. Sure. Yeah. Uh, What's interesting to me and one of my big crit critiques of Moonat is that the, the idea is romantic, but the way that it's applied is extremely classical and rigid. Yeah. So it, it feels like a it's a system of doing natural movements in a very unnatural way. Well, if we're being, you know, if, if we're being 100% honest, I, I don't think Erwan would ever want to do it in a perfect world in a classical way he would do it intuitively because I, I believe he himself trains very intuitively yeah however in a, in a in a goal to make it practical from the application and a um have people signing up and doing it as a gym model i mm -hmm. think that what they found is you can't just be like all right now just go outside and do shit, right like it's yeah. that's a very difficult thing to sell. Hey, come with me, and we're just going to kind of make things up as we go. And you know, in the in the overarching realm of fitness, strength, conditioning, the, the entire industry, right? We're always so many people are always trying to get into that classical. Let me delineate every little piece and have this very reductionist view of what it is that makes up training and good training. And I just love the analogy of like, no, it's probably like real food. Like organic food has got all these little phyto, yeah. like all these little things that we can't recreate synthetically. And so being reductionist in how we look at food or how we look at movement is always going to fall. It's always going to have missing pieces, no matter how fucking detail we get. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big analogy that I've used a lot is the, is the movement, movement as nutrition model and how you, you need whole food movement as the basis of your diet. And we can only, we can only supplement it with. We can only theorize it so much. Uh, yep. We're, we're breaking it down into pieces. It, it's interesting you mentioned that the commercial viability of it. I'll just dig into that for a second because that's what we've experienced is like when we go teach, right? We take people out into a park and we, you know, we use a play based sort of constraint led curriculum that comes out of, uh, you know, just the experience of training parkour for many years and how that that kind of self-organized up to these extraordinary skill levels within the parkour community. And you take that observation and then you combine it with all the research coming out on ecological dynamics and motor learning. And like, okay, random practice works better than block practice. You know, there's so many of these variables that we think that we can control for that we can't. Right. And if we over prescribe and over cue athletes, we actually inhibit their own, their own uh, control mechanisms. So we take people into the park and we say, okay, just go over this branch and go under this branch and go over that branch, or go through these branches, something like that. And don't give them any technical instruction to start with. Just let them start to do it. And a lot of times they'll adopt all the kind of motor patterns or not all of them, but many of the motor patterns that you want to see, the base building blocks are sort of there intuitively. And then you can start ex exercising the principles. And then you can point out, here's another technical variation that would give you a better access to moving with better flow yep the response that we have from the students is like this is life-changing this is incredible this is so powerful but then the problem is they struggle to adopt it so for years we'd come we'd go out and be like people are like this is the best workshop in the industry right mm -hmm. come back a year later and they come and see us again like, what have you been doing I'm like oh mostly you know, portal stuff mostly fighting monkey stuff mostly gmb stuff it's like what <laughs> why and what we realized is that everything else is designed to be able to do, be done in a gym. Everything yep. else is like, you don't have to change your habit, but finding a local park, 
figuring out how to utilize that local park and getting over the social phobia of being seen to be different is a yep. whole set of obstacles for adoption of this romantic style of movement that is uh, is actually really a challenge it's a huge challenge um it's it's a massive massive yeah. challenge it's 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 interesting i mean it's it's very cool to hear you say that it's not cool from a like how do you get people to yeah. to keep doing the thing but all of those uh, almost all those examples i don't know anything about fighting monkey um gmb obviously i know ryan and uh, you know coming from like a, a gymnastics background i have to imagine that their their programs are very classical in do this this and this because they go what, what's nice about gymnastics is you go these are the positions that you want to hit and then you can reverse engineer the big challenge with something that's romantic like even obstacle course racing yeah. well not even that right like random obstacle course racing i guess but like explorative play outside is you there's very little ability to go these are the things you have to do let me reverse engineer if we have a a, a definitive lift yeah, that's why gym <laughs> programming for the gym is so goddamn easy like oh that's what you're gonna do like do that mostly do that and then do a couple other things that are somewhat similar and might build, bring up weak spots but to be a, a, a very well-rounded athlete that can that has many options available to them well you have to train many options and it's it's so difficult people just need that they need the answer just tell me the answer right like we <laughs> I, we did we do a programming um we did a programming certification last year and we're giving all the as much information not all because you can never do all the information right but a lot of information trying to make it simpler than reading the science and practice of of training or super training or any of these right and we get done we're like you have six client avatars that you are largely going to be working with here's a general workout structure in each of these it's a little bit different but it's the same structure this makes it really easy plug and play and people they get done and they're just like i just want you to tell me what to do <laughs> right like by and large there's the just tell me what the hell to do and that's trainers that are learning from us but it's also clients and as soon as we like there's a i, I there was a big push what eight nine ten years ago about um what is it in class when you give somebody the opportunity to pick their own thing um not autonomy but autonomy. I'm, I'm i think it is yeah autonomy okay cool like give them a little autonomy and that's better for sticking long term and i agree with that but but at the end of the day like that's a type of client and another type of client doesn't want that they want to, you to tell them how much to lift and they are so disconnected with they lack all creativity they lack all, all connection with what they're feeling etc and so going back to the commercial viability in my head the way that it makes the most sense from running multiple studios is actually fairly similar to kettlebell training mm -hmm. um so unless i was a kettlebell gym but when you're a kettlebell gym you are you are keeping yourself out of run out of contention to sign up clients that don't like kettlebells mm -hmm. or are scared or intimidated by something they don't know so what i liked to do is in these more classical group fitness personal training type environments is i have periods of time with specialty classes they could be animal flow kettlebells it could be explore outside in the park once a week we go and we put the physical qualities that we built classically to the test which is actually developing them further by having you be adaptable mm -hmm. and uh to me it's less of a commitment because it's anchored in a more classical normal uh understood type of way to train yeah there's a degree where you know from a financial success standpoint or from a just impact standpoint depending on who you are like meeting people where they're at is a necessary component of it like yeah i used to joke a lot that i should just go do a yoga teacher training and just like because it's the biggest brand in all of all of fitness right and it kind of yeah. like the 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 brand sort of works as a transition towards a natural movement idea take people yep. in you get them moving and then you say hey we're going to meet in the park we're going to connect with nature and then you can slowly introduce these things to them 
I've been uh, yeah. far too stubborn to to go down that road, but uh, <laughs> but it makes sense. So well, it, to me, like, and I haven't had the uh, the pleasure of going to one of your events yet. The um, we've we've sat and talked a handful of times in the past. I mean, shit, over 11, 12 years now. It's so funny to have like internet pals. Yeah, yeah. that and, and you and I like our background and like our interests are so closely they mirror each other so closely. It's just the uh you know, whatever, did, whatever circumstances in life led to the next thing just had me kind of branch off a little bit more commercial, like the, the, um, man, the, the change from I'm traveling for 14 months and teaching barefoot with MoveNat to I'm now in fit wall where I've designed my own heart rate monitoring technology on all metal walls and everything is inside with videos was such a difference from a concept standpoint, but from the actually how you move it wasn't all that different <laughs> mm. yeah that's an interesting perspective like you're <laughs> i guess my first thought is i think that's partially because move is 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 actually more like fit wall than it is like parkour in a way in the way yeah that um, yeah i i think so um and, and what, what's cool i think what's cool from a perspective on on that is you were uh, you got an earlier view than I did yeah. on on move that. So you probably helped shape quite a bit of where it was and making it probably more applicable to more people is what my assumption would be. Um, maybe. I'm not sure. It's it's a lot old history, right? Like I don't know. A lot of the audience maybe doesn't know this, but like I was I was working with Irwan on what became uh MoveNet in 2000 I think starting maybe even 2006 2007 2008 kind of just barely into 2009 um and then we had a pretty unpleasant falling out and uh I went my own way uh and then I think it was you and Brian Tabor who he recruited to basically take the role that had been crafted for me um sure well, so in 2010, I went as a participant in the summer to West Virginia. And then the reason I got hired, to be honest, is Erwan and I had the same birthday. And so I think he thought it was like a pretty mystical intervention. Right. And I could jump and lift things and yeah. whatnot, right? And, and was in the field. But um, so I worked all of 2011. Tabor, I knew from San Diego State because we're both there. So I recruited Tabor. So like I, I ta okay. taught all these things took the curriculum i made it for me to do and be successful i needed it to be very much more regimented like this is the order of how we're going to teach each day whereas erwan was free-flowing everything i remember when i went i was watching and i was like i think this guy's making like half of this up as he's like go no, he wasn't making half of it up but like some of it up right and yeah. certainly it was it was very free flowy mm -hmm. which is has its own benefits but if your goal is to recreate that with additional instructors down the low line, like there's not any chance of that being a reproducible experience. And if we wanted to have, you know, I taught 88 workshops in 14 months. If you're going to repeat things, you kind of need it to be somewhat similar each time. And uh, so I, I kind of crafted that. Things were going fairly well. That's why I, I called up Tabor, Kellen uh, Milad, and mm -hmm. then Amy, Amy, who could, became my wife, Amy um train train each of them up in that in that way and then um and then similar uh we had some differences in uh things coming up with the certification so ended up taking off myself uh in the summer of 2012. yeah summer, yeah too early 2012 and uh started getting you know back to back to less travel and other items that were very cool it's interesting because it's interesting to hear that story because like i've always wondered why MoveNet feels so unnatural um and like so i, I didn't really spend that much time with everyone like i i got to we i met him in nice in 2007 and then <clears throat> we spent like a day together yeah he was super big ideas you know totally random sort of training sessions and then uh and then he came out 
I think the way it worked was he came out in 2008 and we had been exchanging ideas back and forth, but I've been teaching in the parkour community for a couple of years at that point. Mm -hmm. So we brought like a whole group of parkour people to my family property. That was, as far as I know, the first like public movement retreat was at the Sunrise Shire where Return of the Source was held. Um, and uh, we built an obstacle course in the woods and taught there. And Erwin like was making stuff up on the week that he arrived. It was doing all this. It was, but it was, there was this weird formality to it. Like he wanted to do all these variations on walking, right? He wanted to do backwards walking, forwards walking, sideways walking, walking low. And, um, and it was like, this is super boring. And, and like to define what efficient was in those movements. And then, <laughs> The thing that really bothered me was that he he wanted he was he was watching YouTube videos to craft the self defense portion of it because we had the com combatives were part of the original material that we were going to teach. So mm -hmm. I, I got to to train with everyone in the martial arts, and I realized that he wasn't really competent. So I actually hired my my Muay Thai coach, who's a self defense expert and uh, former Marine, to teach the 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 self-defense aspect of it um right but but i saw that classical aspect from him then and i always thought it was because he was an engineer like his perspective on on movement came from an engineering perspective he didn't really have a coaching background coming into the art so it's interesting to hear you say that your experience was it was very free-flowing very romantic more like maybe what you'd experience coming to work with us now but we've yeah. worked really hard to create some sort of replicability there right like there's an education system, a system of principles to give people the ability to craft this kind of artisanal movement thing. That's every park is different because we're taking people into the trees in Hamburg and they're not the same trees as they are in, in, uh, in, in, in Copenhagen. So we have to actually have staff that can go figure out what the trees are, how they exp how they explore the principles that we want and how to adapt it to the group that we're working with, which means that the, the startup cost to develop a coach is dramatically higher. Oh yeah. 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 Our, like the way, so my schedule with, with those courses was I would, I would look on Google maps to figure out which freaking mm -hmm. park I wanted to go. Cause I had to check certain boxes. Yeah. Um, like, Hey, you should probably have a bathroom there if there's eight hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hey, if it's going to be raining, we probably need to have like contingency plans of, can we be dry at least for some of it, yep. um, et cetera. And, and so the, the training was have our new coaches, Amy, Brian, Kellen, they came to a couple as participants. Then we co-taught for two to three and then they were solo. Yep. Um, but by having the day mapped out, like you're saying, it's just like, Hey, this is the section where we're going to do this. These are the goal climbs. These are the goal lifts that we're going to be doing. These are the goal balance that we're going to be doing. Now we're going to figure it out based on what's there, which does have that adaptability feature. Yeah. And every so often, it just you show up, and you're like, shit, this is not going to work the way that I wanted to. I got to hit Home Depot at 7.30 a.m. and grab two by fours <laughs> and concrete bags. And, and it's going to be donated somewhere. For the day it was it was a wild i mean for me you know what it did for me from an adaptability standpoint from a coaching adaptability standpoint man and i'm sure you feel the same way when you show up and mm -hmm. you're like right. Shit, it's, it's dewy today it's wetter today than we expected so all of a sudden some of this balancing stuff is going to be significantly more challenging than it was uh, when we started um made for a help makes you makes me made me a lot more adaptable i mean you you know when i get new <laughs> new instructors and they show up and like we're in a different room than we were going to be in i'm like don't worry it's four walls it's indoor there's bathrooms there's parking like a different room ain't that big a deal when you show up and there's glass in the bathroom and it's snowy in philadelphia and it's 12 hours before you're supposed to start like that is adaptable the most adaptable i had to ever be was when i was leaving some crawling stuff in the big ass park in philly and I was like, oh no, that's a condom right <laughs> there. 
I'm never coming back to Philly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've run into condoms. We've run into human feces, you know, uh, glass, needles. And there, there is why you see the practical nature of working on a side. Sure. Uh, what, what park did you teach at in Philly? Uh, what's the big ass park uh, that I can't remember? Fairmont Park? It's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Fairmont. Yeah. I think it is it's so big. I can't even tell you where it was. I taught there twice. I, I did go, and I thought, oh, this worked out really well. Like the area right here, minus the common. Um, everything else was totally perfect uh, with the, with the arrangement. Um, but every time I went to the, the two events I taught in Philly, both times I got sick afterwards. I was like, done. I'm not going back there. I was told that uh, I should teach there as well. And I, so I, I would arrive two days early to scout in New York. Yeah. So I arrived on the first day and uh, it was a crazy experience because I like reached out to some friends in the parkour community to see who I could stay with. You know, this was early on in the, the workshop series, literally, I think my second workshop. Uh, it was No, I went to I went with Jason C. Brown to teach up in uh, uh, his area. So it was a different park. So the second okay. time I was told to go to that park and. Um, and Jason was not available. He was out of town teaching. And so I, I kind of like hit up the parkour community to see who I could go stay with. And so someone offered me to stay at their place. And I went and realized that like it was in the middle of the ghetto. Like it was just completely boarded up houses everywhere. And he, he was staying in a single room apartment with two re roommates. And their their beds were just gymnastics mats that were, that were folded up against the wall. And there was just like a giant like video game center. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And it was, you know, like it was an attic, basically. And so this is the night that I arrive right before I have to go scout. And so like it's uh you know, I get there, they're playing video games, I'm trying to fall asleep, you know. Like he puts me down in part of the bedroom at 3 a.m. Like his roommate's girlfriend comes in, she's seven months pregnant, and I'm <laughs> in her area. <laughs> And she's not happy about it. So there's a whole fight. And then and then at 6 a.m. after playing video games until like midnight, he gets up and wants to go jump on a trampoline directly outside. <laughs> and so he jumps <laughs> up on a trampoline. So so I get up and I go and I hike out of the ghetto down into Fairmont Park, which is right there. And I'm kind of on one side of the park. And I walk through the park for like 14 hours. Yeah exploring every part of the park and cannot find the area that I want to train on by like here's a piece here I could use but it's really far from this other piece finally I found the spot which is absolutely amazing um I don't want to give it away because I don't want to attract a bunch of people to to go overuse that spot but it's a really sweet spot if you know the folks in Philly they can take you out there um it turned out to be an amazing spot but I found it like with like 30 minutes left on the first day of scouting. And then I got to go back the second day. And also I was able to contact one of my friends in the jujitsu community who had a beautiful house and put me up. <laughs> and I was good after that. <laughs> but, yeah. It sounds like a much better experience. stay. <laughs> it's quite, whoa. Uh, yeah. You know, Seattle where I was living at the time doesn't have nearly the same sort of level of differentiation of poverty. Right. So like the next time that I went and taught in Philly, I t stayed near the Bryn, Ma Bryn Mauer in the suburbs there in like a $6 million house um, with one of my students. And I was like, oh my God, this is just a whole other world. It's a lot better. It's a lot better, yeah. Well, it's a lot nicer to stay in for sure. That at least, yeah. Tennis courts and basketball courts and everything. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, that just took me down memory lane. So you you did this the moon that thing for a long time, and then you went to animal flow and uh, and the kettlebells. So you've really crafted a very unique perspective on what the kettlebell offers as a tool, um, mm -hmm. and that's been something I've been very interested in because I I do think there's a limit to the. I feel like a lot of the industry is still stuck in like powerlifting and and bodybuilding perspectives on what gpp should look like um yep. and it's you hit the you hit a limit with it like i've i've back squatted uh 355 for five reps of deadlifted 440 um 
and I could jump really high at that point. I could jump really far from two legs, but my yep. fluidity of movement and my athleticism and my kind of structural integrity were actually pretty bad at the peak of my performance. I was also killing it in CrossFit at that time. So I like, it was, it was such a strange experience. I moved to Seattle, started teaching the parkour classes here, but I was teaching, I was teaching CrossFit. Eventually I would end up teaching at this gym, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, four, five, six, and then at seven, and then at eight, I would get to teach the parkour classes. So then I was trying to get myself strong. So I was doing Mark Ripito's Texas program. Mm -hmm. But then the staff there were always the, the the owner of the gym really wanted me to do the wads with them every time that the staff came in and did the wads. So a couple of times a week I would like get in and do a wad. Yeah. And I was trying to do my parkour training on top of this. So somehow I managed to like gain 20 pounds of fat while taking my squat and deadlift up like a hundred pounds each and getting my friend down to like 223. <laughs> I was, I was killing these CrossFit wads, you know, near world class. Um, yeah. And I was just chubbing up like you couldn't believe. And then my movement quality just fell off a cliff with parkour. Yeah, that makes sense. The, um, so you, you, you mentioned kettlebell being an athletic tool. Yeah. So, before I before I get there, the governing um, theme for everything that I've done training for myself was for so long and truthfully still is, how do I feel better on the basketball court? Okay. How do I feel more fluid, more explosive, more dynamic? And the challenge that you said, the governing principles in fitness tend to be bodybuilding and, and like powerlifting. And I, and I agree. And I think so much of it is because it's much more quantifiable than saying, I feel better on the court yeah. or I feel better in parkour. And so because it's very difficult for me as a, a, su a success coach to point to, he feels better. Therefore I'm winning. Mm -hmm. um, it's so much easier to point to a number and more is, I mean, like not to get Western, Eastern, whatever, but like Western, we like more and yeah in lifting stuff, more wins. So of course people think more is more, but to your point, more, it's not just a point of diminishing returns it's a point of negative returns. And I don't know where the hell that is. I think yeah. it's different for every person. It's probably different for every person at different points in their life. Mm -hmm. And so I just know that at a certain point, and for me on big sagittal bilateral stuff, that point is when I'm not making easy progress anymore. Yeah. If I'm not making easy progress anymore, then I don't think I'm going to get a whole hell of a lot out of those big bilateral lifts. Now, that's me. I've been lift, lifting in some way, shape, or form for 25 years. If it was somebody brand new, they need to spend some years to get a, like, I think a big base of strength is still beneficial, but it's lower than what pe most people think. Like certainly a bench press, who gives a shit unless you are bench pressing? Yeah. Like it just doesn't make any difference. Um, but a squat and a deadlift and probably a trap bar deadlift, if I'm being honest, um, versus, versus a barbell. Cause I don't like nowhere else do I need to move my shins and knees around a bar other than with a barbell. If you, and, and then at that point you go trap bar deadlift and squat are a little superfluous, like as far as setup and how most people do them. So maybe just pick one of the two. I, I, I do both cause they they'll train your trunk differently and you can change your angles better with the trap bar. Um, but I think that, you know, those, I think a realistic thing is to get to a double, a double body weight trap bar and a 1.5 squat. Like those numbers make sense to me. If you can have those at that point, maintain, probably don't need to push it up higher. Some people pushing it up higher gives them more results. Some people, they just feel terrible. If I keep chasing it, I feel stiff. I feel blocky. I don't feel good. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what happened to me when I was hitting those numbers, which was, 440 was two times deadlift um and uh 355 was you know I was 2 210 at that point so yep and so you know it's it's um like what good is it do to me I'm not ribboning I'm not making money I don't get any enjoyment like I don't want to spend my time being stiff and so what where I've landed with it 
is if I can maintain those basic numbers, which you, by the way, you, you can maintain them by training power. You can train them by being stronger in more different positions. No, your one RM won't be as high as it could, but everything else feels better. So mm-hmm. why would you do otherwise? That's my position to where that goes into with kettlebells is kettlebells allow more. It's easier to train in more dynamic curvature style lifts Mm -hmm. that are not perfectly vertical up and down that are not as stiff requirement they require you to have some fluidity on part of your body and some stiffness on part of your body which looks like the way that we move most of the time Um, because of the extension we can start getting the pendulum like effect and the classical way people use them is just a kettlebell swing and that's it, right? In fact, like the traditional schools are like, you only do it this way and don't do anything mm-hmm. else. I'm like, yeah, but we can swing it in all these other directions that then make us respond accordingly. Yeah. And so that's where, that's my methodology of, of how to use the kettlebell. It follows a very, a pretty clear, like classical progression chart. Uh, my old company was called BA Training and BA meant be able, mm-hmm. then be athletic, then be adaptable. And then the joke is badass after that. But by being able, like you set the, the the stage, I know that I've at least got some quantifiable physical characteristics that should buttress forces and allow me to push force out in some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Very quickly, be athletic. All athletic means to me is that we have more total demands, not more load, but more total demands to control. Mm. Going from a, a goblet squat to a single side squat is more athletic in my book for gym context in that as I descend and come up, I have to control lateral flexion and rotation a little bit more. Yeah. And, and that's it. Um, and then be adaptable is now can you apply this in different contexts? The, 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 in the gym, that means like, all right, let me see you squat wider stance now. (laughs) Like it's so, and you haven't done it before. Like, okay, do you go to pieces? If I change your, dance on a squat because a lot of people do a lot of trainers come to the things i'm like why don't you try squatting why like it just feels weird i can't do it and i'm like huh well that sucks like you can't move in a different way than you squat every week that's mm-hmm. pathetic yeah. um in kettlebell specifically adaptable like it gets a lot of hate and honestly like i i, I give it i give it pseudo hate like the old man angry hate is the whole kettlebell flow yeah a phenomenon that's somewhat be adaptable and, and like if i'm training with you and i'm like all right this is what we're gonna do let's go in this combo this combo this combo now you go well you've never done it before so now you have to string together all your skills and figure out how to make it look smooth and yeah. then if you come up with something so that's somewhat adaptable it's not it's like playing horse with kettlebell mm-hmm. um it's not particularly crazy it's certainly not like trying to kettlebell on a tree limb mm-hmm. um right like but it's somewhat and in a gym context it, it falls under that category because in the gym unless i'm like literally playing tag or throwing balls that bounce funny, there's not gonna be a whole, like we're not we're not sitting there and all right, it's personal training. I need you to be adaptable. Okay, ready, set, bench press, go. And like you run and do the bench press. Um, and I'm like, psych, now it's a bench instead of a bar that you're pressing. Like you just can't really be truly adaptable in a gym environment. So I'm not worried about it. That's just the context that shapes what I'm trying to do with the kettlebell. The final thing I'll say with the kettlebell before we get any specifics is um, like the certification that I teach. Most certs teach you to deadlift, to goblet squat and to press. And they teach it as though you were lifting a barbell. All right, squeeze everything, get tight, cinch everything down. I'm like, it's a, like, why am I teaching you how to barbell deadlift with a kettlebell? Let's do something that you can't do with other tools with the kettlebell. So I don't teach, I don't even teach deadlift in the cert or a goblet squat. Like it's a waste of your time if you're a trainer to come and learn how to do it again. Um, let's look at all the ways that it's that there are unique trainable qualities. And those trainable qualities are some stretch shortening cycle, some off center of mass movement, some relax, contract um, as you have to you know, wrangle this damn bell around. Um, I like to get points of contact moving. So your feet Um, on the ground. I like walking stuff. I like stepping stuff because that brief moment of where you contact the ground and then have to control the backswing or the downward movement um, 
you're going to have a larger impulse of eccentric demands that you have to overcome. You have to instantly figure out where you are. You're never going to step in the same place twice perfectly. And so you've got more variability built into everything that you do. Like there's always variability rep to rep, but I'm saying there's even more when you are adding a, a moving step. And so you're solving more problems because it's a more dynamic tool. And so for me, that's really nice. The other benefit is because you're doing it powerfully, um, you're getting, I think you get more out of it than just trying to go heavier and grinding everything from that athletic standpoint. Um, it helps. And the final one is like farmer strength. You know, the farm strong mm -hmm. thing. What do when you're lifting these things that are out to the side or they're offset and it, it literally like you're wrestling this big metal ball. It's just, you know, that's the, that's the thing. Well, you can't lift as much because it's not sitting perfectly. I'm like, that's sort of the point. Yeah. Like bar barrel yeah. guys. That's what, what the body doesn't care what the official load on the barbell is. It cares what the, you know, the summed loads in your joints are they're experienced right the cause totally event. so totally. that like to go back to the like 1.5 squat one two times deadlift like i always like to caveat that and say if you're like approximately normal proportionally but if you're like mm -hmm. six foot seven and weigh 180 pounds and you're an elite like triple jumper like highly unlikely that you're ever going to squat 1.5 body weight <laughs> totally doesn't and, matter at all. So I'm, I'm curious how you think about that, how you, so like for me, I think like I, I would like to, to front squat 300 pounds again. Like I think if I can front squat 300 pounds, I think that's like all the barbell strength that I need. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, so I, 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 uh, last year I got up my split squat up to 225 where that was like the ATG style all the way down uh, split squat, not the, uh, Bulgarian split squat, and I was like, okay, that's that's good. Like I'm, I'm, yeah. pretty, right, I'm, I'm pretty good with that. And I mean, I'm, I don't think I have exceptionally weird proportions, right? I'm like pretty close to uh, sort of eight heads high. Don't have super long, long limbs. I have long arms, but uh, my my legs are kind of normal. I have kind of short shins, which makes squatting not that great for me. Um, mm -hmm. But. Uh, but like when you when you're working with someone who is like a super elastic, naturally uh, thin, longer limbed person, how do you kind of like work that scale of adjustment on what those strength metrics they're looking for is versus maybe somebody who's like a fire plug? They're like, we're going to be able to stack a lot more adaptation out of you by giving you like go go get that four hundred pound back squat even though you're one hundred fifty pounds. Right. So with with somebody like myself because I'm fairly elastic, fairly long limb on a pretty small torso. Yeah. Um, if I, I've done a couple of experiments where I basically take away all heavy lifting, like performance definitely goes down if I do that. Yeah. Performance goes down if I go too high. So the sweet spot of just maintaining a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I had a brand new person that looks a little long limb, that is largely elastic in their, uh, strategies for so basketball players was I mean, for the most part, basketball players, volleyball players. I was, I was, yeah, I would just, I would squat them until the, until the gains dissipate until they qualitatively tell me that they're getting uncomfortable. I'd find a squat position that they're comfortable in. So I'd probably elevate heels if I needed split squat bar, uh, safety squat bar, um, versus like low bar. I wouldn't do a rip -a -toe squat at all. Um, yeah. I'd be toes forward. I wouldn't worry about going ass to grass on it. I'd probably go right to 90 or just above. Um, just the, like their limb length, their femur length, their, their proportions would make that bottom squat position very awkward for most of them. Um, the benefit to me is the total load that's on their body that is starting to approximate even jump, make, like jump positions. And so that quarter to half squat kind of does all that. I would, I would still have them train in some ways like high step ups and, and lunges and i'll actually for mobility people love to full squat i actually like all the different steps for mobility of the hips better anyway because especially if they're a court athlete or any type of athlete you're going in all the directions so i want you i want you to have more exposure to long ranges in more positions than just mm -hmm. a uh arbitrary squat stance um mm -hmm. and so i look at 
the squat and the trap bar deadlift as loading opportunities. And that, that's all they ever are, right? It, it's the easiest way to put the most amount of load on somebody minus machines. So the machines can be, and that's a whole different discussion, but um, from a keeping some sort of, let me use the term dirty term function, whatever, like some sort of or self-organization, not a hundred percent being reliant on the machine itself to give me the overload. Um, the barbell or safety squat to about a half squat. Um, I don't care about ass to grass. I just don't like I would, but I would also have these people squatting toes forward about hip to shoulder width, something that looks like an, an athletic stance versus the toes out um, wide position and, and toes out wide position is the most unathletic looking position that you've ever, like you'll ever find. I always laugh when like squatters or kettlebellers are, are squatting in this position for everything. And then it's no wonder every time they try to walk, run, do anything, they're duck footed. They they're, training themselves to be duck footed they're putting an enormous amount of, of stress and neurological signaling to their body that this is the position where you need to be because i'm going to put you under this type of like it's a learned position um and it's not an athletic position at all yeah it certainly has limitations if it's the only position that you're applied to i'm thinking like feet out wide stance is like that's lateral movement in a in a basketball game right okay. It, it yes and no like if even i think if you like if you hit pause on a defender mm -hmm. they're in a wide outside of shoulder width position yeah but their toes are still pretty far forward and their knees are still pretty far forward and that gives you that angle that you can then move now when i like if i if i also push from rotated at the hip instead of external rotated yeah 100 percent. right it, their knees in mm -hmm. um their knees are in, but their feet are in matching. And so if, if people only looked at the knees up, they'd be like, oh mm -hmm. no, Valgus, but that's just something that doesn't know what they're saying because they're trying to apply squat principles to other movement, yeah. which doesn't make, which I don't think makes sense. But so yeah. like, if you, if your toes forward, like as I push, yes, I'll open yeah, as I take that next that foot out a lot. But, but when they're both planted, that's that, that has them ready to push in yeah. either direction. Yeah, pigeon toed. Interesting. So, um, uh, I, I guess I wanted to shift directions. I had another question that was coming up here because how old are your boys now? About to be three, and a couple months out from six. Six. Okay. So my my oldest child is now ten, and then my my son is eight. And my daughter's very athletic, but she's not as athletically driven as my son. So my son's mm -hmm. kind of the guinea pig to like, you know, try to create the, the super athlete. Um, yeah. And he, so he's at eight years old. Uh, so we haven't tested his vertical jump since, um, since back in like October, I think. But so when he, when he just turned eight, he had a 14 inch standing vertical jump and a 19 inch approach jump, which interestingly, he can approach jump higher off of one leg than off of two legs. Okay. And you, you can just see he's just a wire, right? Like his hip, his knee bend is hip and knee bender is just tiny, right? It's all fascial response. Right. And he can do 15 pull-ups, um, L sit, press to tuck plans. Like he's got all these incredible physical qualities. But he's so elastic right now that like I like I'm just like very hesitant to want him to do any kind of heavy weightlifting until he's probably like I'm thinking 18 years old, right? Like let let, let puberty start wanting to put muscle mass on him, and then then we can do that. But build that fascial system as much as yeah. possible before we try to try to leverage that. And I'm curious how you think about that. Like when not just okay, so we want to get this 1.5 point like you know uh squat for a generic sort of average male athlete uh and then obviously there's this proportions and body structure and uh and sport that varies around that but when do you think about a tap like reaching for that adaptation in the developmental cycle of a youth athlete as they're developing yeah, so I'll preface this with I don't work with youth athletes so this is all conceptual to me and having boys like thinking through what I would do and like what I wish I had done yeah. Um, I, I think that you're hundred percent on the, you don't want to 
potentially take away or interfere with the development of the fascial elastic systems. Yeah. I also think of that as a big neurological component. Oh, yeah. To me, like lifting heavy just changes the way that you're going to have a strategy with things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something like a, a depth jump at body weight is ch training your rebound, like your quickness. Yeah. Whereas some people then load it. But invariably, as soon as you load it, you're now changing the strategy because it's loaded, it's going to be slower. So if you do that, okay, maybe all you do is kind of fuck up your motor ingram of like how you're going to accomplish the task. So I, like, I would also be wor worried, sounds strong, but I'd be considerate of the neurological implications for youth kids in lifting. With that being said, I wouldn't be hesitant in any type of body weight, lunges, uh, jump squats. Um, uh, I think that might be a place for kettlebell swings. Like to, if you are think loading the hinge is important and look, I, I, I teach that you should load the hinge, but my, the curriculum that I, I teach and a little tangent here, like, but the hinge as a movement thing in sport or anywhere, like it's, it's not really its own thing. It's its own thing. Cause we deadlift, right? Like. <laughs> In human movement, sure, you kind of hinge, but really like, you're bending over to pick things up and nobody ever just goes, let me do a perfect hinge when I do this, right? Because we're not picking up heavy stuff. It, it's an art. It's a thing we made up in exercise. Yeah. Just like just like on um, normal human movement, nobody does a perfect bilateral squat, squat through your heels to do shit. You would squat on your toes. You would squat in a, in a kickstand stance. You would not worry about flexing your back. Like these are all arbitrary gym standards that we've applied to movement otherwise. Okay. So that's the tangent. Um, but back to the kiddos, I think some sort of explosive squat hinge combo that's like a kettlebell swing or a trap bar deadlift that doesn't have them having to move around the external load very much. I think that would be beneficial because I do think having more force handling potential is worthwhile. I'd probably be in the 14, 15, 16 range. Yeah. Um, totally, totally fine doing any of that stuff. Um, but I'd be really minimal with it. I, I, I'd want them working their upper body on bars, like climbing monkey bars, pole climbs, rope climbs, uh, gymnast rings. If we're going to do any type of structured stuff, because it rotates, yeah. it doesn't lock them down. Um, I think with kettlebells could be really cool because of the, the skill work that you that you could have there. Um, it's still more elastic and fascial in nature than grinding through big stuff for the lower body. I'd probably be like trap bar and some loaded lunges. Um, I think you'd get a lot of ways with that. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned about the squat. And if I did, it'd be a safety squat bar and it'd be quarter to half squats and like enough to where I'm, I'm not worried about it un changing things too much. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that makes sense because it's it's very conceptual. No, I, mean, I mean, I think we're pretty much on the same page. Um, I I just see so much elasticity in my son in particular. Where yeah. I'm, like, I just don't want to train him out of that at all, right? That, and that's that's the big piece. And this is uh, this is something we uh, I was having a talk with uh, Russin about recently in relation to a, a David Weck conversation about. You should never do a pal off press. Yeah. And you know, my stance with that or heavy lifting in general is, okay, well, how much of this thing do we have to do that it replaces what we would normally do? So I think that the elastic fascial driven system that your son is displaying is the normal way that we would move as humans yeah. if we had to train that way or move that way in life, if we had to do stuff, right? And so if we want that to go away, we either don't use it, which is normal sedentarism, or we displace it by doing other things. Now, if we only do other things, it makes sense. It would push it off to the side and it would be underdeveloped. And would, that's the same thing as not as being sedentary. But if you are still doing all of that on a regular basis, how much of the strengthening stuff can I do before it has negative consequences? Yeah. Because I, I think we can, like, I'm positive. It has positive, positive results. Yeah. But it just can't, it can't push out all the other qualities that we, that we want to maintain. 
or prioritize and, and certainly for an athlete an, a true athlete right because like, yeah. i know that we say strength athletes i'm going to say true athlete and people <laughs> you quote me people get mad but i like to jazz the strength athletes um so i you know i don't know what that amount is but like if you look at those um and, and it's different for youth they recover so damn fast but the the standard thing of like hey if you do a really heavy session you don't have d training on that for some say two weeks some say up to four weeks mm. i'm like okay so if i wanted like right now i like the idea of of doing something heavy like every three weeks and then you power with the rest i maintain perfectly <laughs> and i don't lose anything even as like a 40 year old that has interrupted sleep and i think that would be a an interesting way to go with uh for, for athletes for youth some force is going to be beneficial for them yeah, i don't know how much strength training about once every 10 days over the last yeah since November. Um, and I'm just steadily like I started it, you know, back down after an injury and stuff. I was like 155 on my front squat. And now I'm hitting 235 for sets of seven. And uh, and my dunk has gone from nine feet four inches to nine feet nine and a half inches. Um, which is like yeah. oh, cool. But but what my training looks like is like because I sprained my ankle and stuff, I couldn't run for a while. Uh mm -hmm. I, I just been walking on a treadmill to to build my aerobic base because that's something I didn't really do enough of throughout my development. So yeah. build that aerobic base. Then I do jump drills and jump stabilization drills and ankle development drills. And then I go dunk. And then I do my upper body strength, which is, you know, tuck planges and and muscle up development tools, right? Muscle yeah. or, or pull ups, whatever I'm doing on my pull stuff, because that's super, super specific for me as a parkour athlete. So I'm usually an hour and a half into my session before I touch a barbell. And then when I do, like, if I'm feeling great, I'll do three sets. But a lot of times it's like one set and I come back the next week and I'm stronger. Yeah. And it's, like, it, it, it's like literally 10 to 15 minutes is spent on the classic traditional 10 to 25 minutes is spent on the classic stuff. I also like to hit like a, like um like reverse hyper and nordic curl and uh some some uh seated calf raise standard calf raise just to strengthen that whole posterior chain to make it more resilient to the type of training that i do and with all that stuff basically i'm doing one set and trying to add an isometric component um into it so that you know that those tissues are getting the development that, that they need so I like I, I like you said that my favorite way to train the lower body, reverse hypers, Nordics, hamstring curls, all these things that put the target tissue, the, the stuff that's actually moving me through space, yeah, on a lot of challenge, a lot of stress, get them stronger versus with deadlifts and traditional squats and like split squats and lunges once you get heavy enough, eventually like so much of what you can do is limited by what your trunk core lower back can handle right I, when i go deadlift the only thing that is tired is my grip traps and erectors mm -hmm. right i'll go in i haven't deadlifted heavy and i almost i, I probably could still pull i i want to say like i almost would be annoyed with myself i can't still pull 500 but like i haven't lifted heavy in a long time um because of the meniscal thing it was just it would just be pissed when i lifted heavy so if i got one lift heavy simple as that um but heavy all being relative like it's yeah. it's still 1.5 or double my body weight and that's and I, my hernia also has something to do with not lifting heavy in a bilateral sense trap bar uh trap bar yeah uh, barbell like one of my guys uh this would be a year and a half ago now he was like pr best deadlift i've ever had 500 i was like i wonder if i can still do 500 went and put two and a half pound plates just to talk shit did it cold <laughs> but my goddamn traps and erectors were a disaster for four days because yeah. i don't do that thing yeah. my legs felt nothing right yeah. so you're in and i know that's like unique to, somewhat unique to me but the, the moral story is like you are doing the same thing i'm doing the same thing if we get those tissues those what the, the hamstrings challenge them in a way that doesn't limit your trunk doesn't promote excessive stiffness through the middle yeah so i was i was, I was curious about that because like i've run into you know 
I, I, I dabble in the strength and conditioning world, right? Like I'm, I'm a movement teacher. That's my primary thing. And now I'm like a movement self-development teacher. I spend a lot of time like reading stuff about meaning in life and how that imp uh, impacts, you know, I'm trying to draw connections between philosophy and, and movement more than I'm trying to figure out what the best <laughs> best way to uh, to improve someone's vertical leap is. But sure. I've run into like Bill Hartman and the ideas around the compressive versus um, compressive strategy. What's the other strategy? Expansive. Expansive, strategy. Expansive compressive strategy, internal external rotation, um, and how the 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 heavy axial loading of the back is actually teaching the torso to behave in a way that's contrary to a lot of the athletic adaptions that we want. And yeah. so for your take on that, like, um, and, and again, I, contextualizing it to which athletes are going to benefit from that. Because I think that a lot of people, you know, like when I came into the industry and I was like, it was like Mark Ripito, that's our God, right? Like yep. everybody has to squat 500 pounds, <laughs> you know, or squat 400, deadlift 500, bench press 300. If you do, then you're a real athlete and you'll be great at everything, right? Well, and that whole mentality, right at the beginning, you talk about how powerlifting governs, right? So I, I think that so often those of those of us, not you and I, but other people that have athletic backgrounds like we did, mm -hmm. maybe didn't go and play pro or anything like this, right? We end up in weight rooms and the things that maybe these people in the weight rooms really like are weight rooms and they're really good at mm -hmm. weight rooms. And so they internalize the benefits and they have to make what they do more important. So we push the importance of these metrics in the weight room, um, which is probably not as great for total athletic development. Like there, it has a space. Like I can't, it's hard for me to say that because then people are like, you're saying that it's not good to lift weights. I'm like, no, motherfucker. Like I said, there's a point of negative returns, diminishing and then negative returns yeah. where I want, where I stop is right when I have diminishing returns. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, it's clear that I'm not jumping higher or feeling better. I don't need to do that thing anymore. That's why most of my lifts that I focus on is six to 12 weeks. Cause after that, I'm like, Oh, it's not really moving anymore. And these other things are huge opportunities to push that up. Yeah. Um, but back to the shit, what was the direct question? Usually I'm pretty good at recalling that, but, um, I was talking about the compressive versus expansive strategies and how we, how we think about when, like just maybe this is a way of getting more nuanced about what the negative adaptation we're looking at with is barbell. Uh, is with when we do barbell lifting and how to be more aware of it and then again how are you thinking about that as you're working with different types of athletes so with the barbell um i you just have an opportunity for such a big load and a big load is a bigger neurological signal it's a bigger threat and your body has to remember those signals and threats and strategies to cope with it because it's a louder signal mm -hmm. and so when you're putting this on again and again and again, I think it drowns out the other signals of relaxedness, fluidity, and, and elasticity that we maybe want. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, the way you're doing it, the way that I do it, which is like, it's a piece, but I'm prioritizing all these other aspects. I can build strength with just a little bit of it. And so where I think um, most people go is like, they just, they barbell, back squat and then it's the same strategy even on a goblet squat it's the same strategy on a bulgarian split squat as a reverse lunge everything is that extended on the back so compressed on the back mm -hmm. strategy which has me tightening up everything backside right i'm going to cliff notes it um and i haven't gone i haven't taken a course from bill so i i, I don't want to bastardize it it's like a half-ass understanding because i to me it was a little bit like um my what i bias confirmation mm -hmm. and confirmation bias i'm like oh see he doesn't like it either yeah. and that's not what he's saying he's just saying hey sometimes if we're doing this extended compressed position all the time maybe doing the opposite to give it a little balance um to me it just comes it comes down to the the through line of all training is like probably the thing that you need to do most is the thing that you haven't been doing <laughs> um at a certain point so on that compression to me that tightness through the back if everything's getting compressed and i don't mean like bulging discs exploding or any of that i just mean it's 
it's a get tight strategy you have to take in order to be successful in those lifts in the way that they're cued most often. And if you're sending a giant signal to get tight and do these things, you're probably going to get stuck there be, because you've been doing it a lot and under massive signaling that it's important. And so, you know, going the opposite way, just even, even on, you know, in the basketball court or like as you're, if I'm, I'm not here <laughs> in defensive position, right? Like I'm actually rounded and shruggy and like a little bit more internally and, and, and expansive all through the back when I'm in a defense, defensive stance or when I'm going up to shoot, it's not the opposite. And I, it's such a mismatch, um, unfortunately for, for people, I think you can still get the, like drive the strength qualities, drive the tissue qualities, but then get right back to what you're doing, which is train the elasticity, train the yeah. fluidity, um, mm -hmm. the coordination. It's so funny. Like I remember years ago, I was talking to Kelly Sturatt, who, you know, I respect a lot and has been a good friend to me in the industry, but he was saying like the best athletes in the world run with their feet straight ahead. And, you know, like jump from these kind of like fundamental athletic positions. Now it's like, we, we all have like really high quality, high speed video that we can just stop and look at what an athlete's position is. So you're like, take someone like John Moran and you see him go up for a dunk, Mac McClung. And you're like, mm -hmm. there's not a straight position in his body. Right? Yeah. <laughs> As he's yep. loaded, right. Back is back is rounded feet are turned in turned out like that that block foot is turned all the way out then he's spinning around it punching it's interesting i think jaw when he does a two foot jump he he his heel doesn't touch on his second leg right and so he has completely different sort of like movement strategy on each leg um, and it's different than another athlete you'll see a lot of athletes will touch that heel down on that that leg but jaws super lightly built super elastic oh yeah and so it's a you know it's like what works for him is not going to work for me because you know he's what six three one eighty i'm six one two twenty um yep completely probably different foot structure different balance of strength across it like one thing i noticed about myself is this is like i think one of the things that the way we train i think biases as us towards is strong hips with weak feet um yeah you watch those you know it's been going around social media right now all the maasai guys who are just like bouncing 30 inches yeah 10 times in a row right they're hardly moving their hips at all yeah i know it's wild <laughs> yeah it's like if i if i go down to do a uh a, a broad jump or a you know standing vertical jump like i'm gonna get into my hips and use those big power centers around my hips but my ability to like repeatedly just bounce in place and get a lot of height from just that lower leg component is pretty poor and you right know, a bunch of ankle sprains so that that doesn't help but I think like if you're using a predominantly barbell strategy you're not going to get a lot of foot elasticity no no especially because you, you you know what one of the I mean through all those different strategies that those different size people take when they're stepping into and moving, the thing that you never do with a barbell is step into and move, right? There's never this control. The like they're talking about, ooh, we're going to change the eccentric, we'll go down fast. I'm like, that's that's fine, but you know what? When you're actually moving through space, like you're actually moving through space, and that means that the load is not purely vertical. Yeah. That's one of my things I, I particularly like about the kettlebell, the landmine and cables. Yeah. Uh, like a, a jump drill that I'm a big fan of. I just haven't seen a lot of people do it. And I'm positive other people do it. Is I hold the cable and then I step into and pivot like I'm doing my penultimate and final block foot mm -hmm. on the jump. And I just load it super goddamn heavy yeah. and just go to the bottom, pause and come back up. So it's purposeful deceleratory work on an angle. And I'll step down off a step. You, it starts to mirror that position fairly well. And, and I never know how cute I want to get about mirroring positions in the weight room because you can't be perfect. You might just get like the negative consequence, like swinging a heavier bat it actually just screws up your bat swing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does feel very good. It feels really like you have to get stiff in the foot. You have to work on 
you're going to pivot into it just like on the block foot. Um, you mentioned jaw doesn't touch his heel. I think that even when people touch their heel, it's a kiss, right? And it's not a, it's not a slam, but where I, where I coming back to the bad strategy, you see a lot of these folks that train a ton of stuff pushing through their heel. You start to see the strategy of, I got to get that heel down to be at, to do accomplish my task. Yeah. The industry that, tells you if your heel's not on the ground, you can't access your posterior chain. I know. Right. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, y'all don't know about the big toe. Like, have you, you met it, right? Yeah. And so like, even right now, uh, you know, the name David Gray, uh, David He's, Gray rehab. Yeah. Yep. Like fan. super smart, right? Like, so the way that they hinge, it's one of these things. Like I, I, I love hinging with the, uh, landmine because you can lean into it yeah. and you can shift into your forefoot and you know, what lights the hell up your ass mm -hmm. and you're like barely touching with your heel. And that the hinge that they teach is the heavy forefoot yeah. hinge. I, the landmine I've never, I haven't played with landmines that much until recently, but I, I had a really bad ankle sprain November of 2021. And like, I'm still recovering from that ankle sprain. Um, Brutal. And then I had an ankle sprain this October on the other ankle, luckily. And mm. that one's coming along a lot faster, but I've, I'm still just kind of working through getting my ankles. Literally, like I think in the last like four weeks, three weeks, I like start to feel like I have like good parkour feet again, or my feet feel agile and strong and explosive on the ground. Um, but the thing that made the biggest difference, I was working with PTs for two years, everything like all kinds of exercises, really, you know, progressive PTs. I got into a landmine press and just put my foot as far out leaning away as possible and just inverted my foot and everted my foot and just loaded it through that slant of the, of the landmine. Yeah. Lit everything up around the ankle and immediately started feeling stronger and better in that ankle. And then I switched and did the inversion. So I have my foot so that, it, you know, the same side and opposite side and I do the inversion eversions and then switch and do it the opposite way. And that's been just magic for my ankles. I swear it's made more, difference than anything else and then i do jumps with the with like you know a single leg jump with the with you know again on both sides um and then switching and yeah yes yeah. that's, that's been just gold for me on recovering my ankle stability because you know your ankle but it's 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 how do you safely load the ankle in a way that actually mimics the actions that you're going to injure your ankle at. Right. The if you imagine that landmine press and your um so the 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 leg that's closest to the landmine, right? Call that the yep. equilateral side. If you if you load that and you take yourself deep into the to the ankle eversion, that's very much like a position that you'll get doing acrobatics if you come short on like a corkscrew or a flip. And you come into that ankle, you're going to come in on this really slanted angle, and you have to be able to buffer that deep eversion position. Sure. And that, uh, and it's like, it's so, it's so golden to be able to just get into that corner. And yeah. Work it. Um, and so I love the landmine press for that. Yeah. The, um, you know what work? Have you played, are you familiar with the, the WEX steps at all? I haven't played with the WEX steps yet. I'm definitely like, I, I encountered Weck like years ago, and then he came out as like Uncle Weck and had that whole persona online, which was a super huge turnoff to me. And a bunch of my buddies in the industry started like going deep into all the Weck stuff. And I was just like, I don't know. I, I just can't deal with any more of these weird gurus. Um, yeah. But recently it, he's kind of toned down the persona and I've like seen how there's like a, there's like a co common thread between what he's talking about, what a Darian Barr is talking about, what some of these other people are talking about that really starts to make sense to me. Uh, yeah. it's like, hey, your body isn't straight lines. You you work in spirals. You got to be able to support yourself on one side and then the other side. If you're stuck in the middle, you're not going to go fast. Um, like yeah. All that stuff is like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. And uh, I, I'd like to have I'd like to have David on the podcast sometime soon. I got to got it. Get I was it. just going to say for your ankles, the, the WEX steps, mm -hmm. I mean, look, a, a, they're better than slant boards, but you could do a lot of it with slant boards where you're literally just like stand on, I mean, shit, you can go train on a hill, right? Like, like you're, you're already outside. 
grab grab a bell or your buddy and squat <laughs> your buddy in different positions on the hill. Talk about variety and variability. Yeah. Um, it's built built right in, and plus you get. Anyway, moral story. I was I was saying those are really cool. I made a couple notes over here of a couple of landmine things that sound similar to what you're doing. That mm-hmm. I've always done. I get questions quite a, a bit from people like, "Why are you setting up in these positions?" Mm-hmm. And I and the main thing for me, bringing it back to you're talking feet, is that the the way that we disperse energy into and through the feet changes drastically based on the loading implement that we use. Yeah. So when we're moving over ground, we're constantly pushing not directly down, we're pulling underneath, or we're pushing up and away. And so the biggest challenge or the biggest limit uh, mismatch, I guess you could say, with traditional loading, which is always just enhancing gravity, is that when we're moving, it's not just resisting gravity. We're moving ourselves through space. Mm-hmm. And that's that's where those pendulum-like movements from a landmine, from a cable, from the kettlebell that we can mimic. And I think that is actually what makes it feel better. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't seem to have like any of these types of, uh, I don't know of any study that says, hey, a landmine squat is going to outperform a traditional squat in a jump. It would make sense to me because as I push forward, I'm up and forward, which is where I would broad jump. Uh, yeah. Like if you, there, there's an attachment called the linebacker attachment. So it's big shoulder pads with handles and yeah. you attach it to your, to your squats feel so great. Like when you get up, you just want to finish through your toes. Yeah. yeah. When you deadlift, I mean, you want to finish through the toes. Got into accommodating resistance through like mindful mover. And, uh, and then I'm, you know, I was reading Franz Bosch and, and, and his stuff. And so I, I've been playing with, and then I've been thinking a lot about, yeah, not like, how do I get out of just being actually loaded when I'm doing these barbell lifts? So like one of the things that really traditionally irritated me in parkour was doing a lot of Kong vaults or um, split step front flips, because you, you have to have this very negative shin angle when you're on your penultimate step, right? You're going to take two last foot placements, then your feet are going to come off the ground together. But that last, that second to last step you have this really strong negative shin angle. It's kind of similar to the way that you approach a uh, two foot basketball gym, right? Mm-hmm. So that block leg, that one would get irritated for me. And so I kept thinking like, okay, cool. I can, I can kind of get into a similar position and have be loaded straight down, but that's not at all what it's like when I'm actually doing the thing. So I started yeah. loading myself up with bands to pull me down. So when I was doing all that, when I was kind of uh, doing some of the ATG stuff, I was like, I'm going to like, the ATG split squat's great, but like the the top 70% of it is really underloaded. Yeah. Because it's limited by that bottom 30%. But if you add a yep. band that's pulling you forward as you're finishing that hip, now it's way more similar to um what I'm actually doing in parkour. And so I got into yep. that. And then uh most recently I was doing some like uh you know banded uh clean and step ups, right? So the band's pulling the hips back so we can really push through with the hips and uh, into the step. And that stuff just feels feels like it's more athletic, feels like it's going to work better. Right. So uh, that's the term I use. Uh, I love that term, the qualitative. It feels more athletic. You know who, why you're qualified? Because you do athletic shit, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah. And, and so when, like, I see like the the refrigerator moving S&C coach be like, yeah, that's you can't do specificity. I'm like, you can't run or jump. Yeah. You, like, I don't have to tell you, man. Um, you know, people always get mad at, at these coaches uh, or at these like LeBron or these folks that are, you know, doing weird shit and balancing. Mm-hmm. You know what? They know their body way better than than we do. And that motherfucker's been playing. You know, he's a freak. Like, so I don't ever like talking about him. But you know, you look at a. Even like Curry would be another, I guess, another example. Like, he shows a lot of his training. He does a lot of like really basic stuff. And for him, yeah. he was such a slight guy. You look at his, his, I, he's been hurt this year, unfortunately, but um, I guess it takes away from my point. He did some basic strength training stuff and that seemed to be massive for his ankles. So this is taken all the way back to the beginning. I was like, the same shit doesn't work for the same person at the same time in their life. Like we, we, ha- we accumulate new injuries. You, the stuff you do now has to take into consideration that you busted your ankles yeah. and now you got to accommodate for that as well. 
Yeah. That accommodating resistance, by the way, that you that you're talking about there, um, is one of my favorite things. We 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 have a a, a course called uh, training methods, and mm-hmm. one of the sections uh, it goes R and T, so reactive neuromuscular training. This is like you put the band around your knees so that you people fix their knees, right? Fix their knees. Um, then we have accommodating resistance, which is traditionally you're going to be going against or yeah against the strength curve so that you get more resistance as you get stronger through the end chains bands and then the third version which i call a mix of the two um it's like a second line of pull second overload action so when you're doing the a band around the hips on a deadlift it's it's not adding more resistance as you get into a stronger position it's a different line of pull so when you bang your hips on the step ups mm-hmm. it's just another element and to me it's a huge opportunity to make shit more athletic my be able be athletic be adaptable it's somewhere between be athletic and be adaptable you just have more shit to overcome mm-hmm. and and if it allows you to challenge like that's one of my favorite like on all lunges is tie your hips to a cable that's a low anchor point or a a horizontal anchor point get an element of horizontal resistance in addition to your bell that you're holding whatever type of bell you want to hold and all of a sudden like when you do a reverse lunge if if someone has any damn awareness of what their body is doing you feel your foot pull you forward over that foot which completely changes the recruitment patterns of all your posterior chain because now there's a pull element versus just a drive push up element. Yeah. And I'm not saying push up elements bad. I'm saying it's different and that's it. Well, and then athletically you need the pull. A hundred percent. Yeah. So if you give me my choice, I'm doing that. Like even on, like I love Bulgarian split squats, right? Mm -hmm. It's as good. I think it's as good as exercise as you can do. Maybe if like the stupid game of, you're only allowed to do one thing. I'd probably pick Bulgarian split squat for the lower body. But that you know, one of my favorite ones um, is your rear foot in a TRX strap, mm-hmm. so that as you stand up, you're actually moving everything forward. Yeah, yeah. It's nasty too. Like mm-hmm. as when you do that one, it's really rough. Um, but anyway, yeah, specificity. So, so like. You post it on social media pretty regularly, and usually it's some funky kettlebell drill that I've never seen anybody else do. And you call it doofusing, and you talk about yeah. how it's getting into these corners athletically. Yeah. So, like for me, intuitively, a lot of this stuff makes sense. It's like, oh yeah, like okay, if you're if you're practicing dunks and all of a sudden your groin is acting up, like okay, how do I get this kind of spiraling action? in a way that I can load it a little bit more intentionally so it doesn't have to be 100% maximal. Like, so I'm not thinking about dunking. I'm thinking about what's going on right there in that grundle, right? Yeah. But this, you brought this problem up earlier. Like, how do we quantify that type of thing, right? Like, when we're starting to play with kind of the palette of athletic, you know, loading strategies, a little bit more with more creative openness you know like you could say i when i squatted 300 pounds my 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 vertical jump was 30 inches you know whatever it is right if you have like 60 varieties of kettlebell swing games yeah. how are you tracking how that's actually impacting your primary sport goals if the primary thing is improving, then I just keep doing what I've been doing. Like <laughs> that's literally that. Yeah, that's literally all I would do. But like my met, you know, for for you, parkour, exploring, tree climbing, right? It's not like you're able to go out there and be like, all right, elevate that branch one more inch and let's <laughs> PR, <laughs> right? Like, no, like you either do or you don't. On the basketball court, I I don't have the control to say this is better and so like faster isn't necessarily better um like your ability to control your body right (laughs) the the, just control is the number one aspect that's better on most fields of play when you get to track and field it's a one-off almost quantitative output Right. That's why I will 100% of the time. So if you, if you said, who's a better athlete, Usain Bolt, Devin Hester, 
For anyone that doesn't know, Devin Hester is the kickoff returner. It was on the Chicago Bears that did, I don't like all of them. He returns for touchdowns, apparently, on punts. <laughs> I will pick Devin Hester as a better, a superior athlete 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. Usain Bolt had one output run as fast as you can in a straight line. Hester, run as fast as you can in a straight line, but maybe change direction every couple steps while trying not to get murdered by a 300 pound specimen. Keep track of 11 players on one side, 10 players on yours, hold this ball that throws off your running cadence and stay in bounds. Like, yeah. okay. At the same point, right? Like, you know, years ago, I, I wrote an article, I don't know if you saw it, about what it, what does it really mean to be a generalist athlete? And I was kind of tracking how it feels like that idea had kind of died in the 80s. It used to exist. That was like the, the old time strongman and George Hebert and all those guys. But it really kind of died down in the 80s. And everyone was like... It's just aerobics or it's just bodybuilding. And then in the 90s, you started getting functional fitness and all these things. And then CrossFit just explodes, right? And then you've got movement culture and Edo Portal and that kind of... I don't think people necessarily recognize how much movement culture really grows up in the shadows of CrossFit. Um, oh, yeah. The space that CrossFit created. Um, but CrossFit offered this idea that you should be a, a Olympic weightlifter, middle distance runner, uh, and um gymnast gymnast okay <laughs> so like i was i was very intrigued by their model at the beginning of my thinking like before i met erwan in 2005 i was doing parkour and reading about crossfit hanging out on the crossfit forums and i had done martial arts since i was six years old but i was like so my first question was like where is martial arts and then also it seems to me already that parkour is superior as a general athletic development tool to gymnastics. Yeah. So over the years, I've come to say, okay, it's a parkour athlete, maybe a strong man and a martial artist. Like martial artists and parkour are strong for me. And then I would add dance later. Um, okay, I was about to interrupt you and, and interject that. <laughs> <laughs> but team sport athlete has really risen up on the developmental pyramid for me. For like, who's a really good athlete? I remember training with uh, the Movement X crew, like Edo students. Mm-hmm. They're like, you know, team sport athletes aren't good movers. And I was like, really? Mm-hmm. And I, <laughs> and so we were working this ground flow pattern, right? Like going down to the ground, spinning and coming up out of it. So I was, wa- I just happened to like a couple of weeks later, watch uh, some highlights of a, of of ba- uh, baseball and i saw the shortstop do the exact same pattern right hitting the ground coming up but the difference was that he wasn't thinking about this pattern to make it look pretty in a gym like he's catching a screeching ground ball going 90 you know to 100 miles an hour in a bang bang play where he has to catch it turn around and throw smoothly to the shortstop yep like, okay, who's the, who's the good mover? And then, like, go watch some Fernando Tatis. I know he's, you know, drug cheat right now, whatever. But, like, watch his highlights. Watch him drop into the splits. Watch his mobility. Yeah. Watch his explosive ability. Watch his problem solving. Like, who's really the good mover? Um, so, I, I have a – to me, the movement culture yeah. folk are, by and large, like the hipsters of the SNC community. <laughs> I it's like, oh, you weren't cool and played the cool sport. So you created this other thing, which is just like less impressive dance performative that you're doing. And and like you can't take the skills that you're doing, like the cool, you can do weird mobility shit, but you can't you can't do anything else, man. Like, like if I throw you a ball, you do like you look like a, a 78 year old mom that hasn't done anything. It's just like spaz out. Yeah. Um you don't learn shit quickly. You just have these very, very arbitrary things that you can do. There's no response to this. There's no adapt, like the reactivity component for uh, for all athletic discussion. If there's not a reactivity component to me, then, it, then it's less impressive than anything with reactivity. Yeah. So the way we've thought about it is, and this again comes from a martial arts background. It's like in the martial arts, we know, like if you, if you've gone through the traditional martial arts into MMA, it's like the bullshit's been detected, right? Yeah. Like we all thought we were fi- training to be fighters doing pretty patterns. In- doing katas. Katas, right? It's like, no, yep. no, we weren't becoming fighters. We were, we were just, we were just becoming bad dancers without music. Yep. Um, yep. And 
And then, and then MMA comes around and it's like, okay, well, what actually makes a fighter? Well, you, you got to solve the problem of someone trying to fight back. And so who is the most impressive runner? The guy who runs in a straight line or the guy who can avoid, you know, 11 guys screaming down the field, trying to take his head off for me. Yeah. Tyree Kill, that's my example, not Devin Hester, but Devin Hester works too. But yeah. the interesting is that Tyree Kill's movement strategy is so different from Usain Bolt's, right? They say that Tyree Kill's foot is on the ground 80% of the time while he's running. He's still managing to run like 22 miles per hour, but he's low, he's squatted, and he can change direction at any time. Yep. And his and his perceptual abilities are just absurd right yeah and to me that's that's what it is so we talk about that as aliveness right we want to train people to have access to athletic attributes in an alive way which means that you can do it reactively to a changing environment or changing other agents in the environment yep it's been interesting uh so i sprained my i told you i sprained my ankles right so because i sprained yep. my ankles it's I can't, like I had to kind of stop training outdoors for a little while during the winter here because the cold was really hard on my ankles. Yeah. And so there's a really awesome space called Life Force Ninja, which is a Ninja Warrior gym. Now is a bunch of parkour equipment and a parkour program starting up here in Bellingham. And it was like, it's warm. The ground's not too challenging for my ankles. Uh, my kids love it. We'll go back to another thing about how people like it when they know what to do my wife yep. loves and she doesn't want to go to parkour with me yeah so i'll go there get a great session in doesn't challenge my ankles too much it's great so my skills like a lot of my parkour skills have been like leveling up really nicely and now i'm taking it back out into nature and it's really interesting to to like okay i've built the theory over the last decade but then to feel it in myself yeah like all these little aspects of moving my feet on weird surfaces pretty atrophied after a month after five months in the gym yep and think about that that the athleticism and dynamic dynamicism that come back from that so like i just started doing a run down this creek which has these beautiful sandstone boulders that are just completely different shapes and so you run down that and it's like every step is a different distance yep different stability different angle that the foot has to land at different like level of up and down. Yep. And the way that my ankles and feet feel after a run down that, like it's like all these tissues, all this neurological connections that weren't there when I'm running on flat carpet to ground or all of a sudden, boom, they're exploding back to life. Oh yeah. It's really interesting. I went, I went to uh, visit a friend, uh, one of my cousins who has a farm yesterday. And we were planting trees and he was barefoot. So I took my shoes off. Right? I've done all this barefoot stuff over the years, but I haven't been barefoot recently. And the ground is not flat, right? It's all these like weird shapes and they're soft. They're not super hard, but you can feel that every step, my foot is getting deformed in weird ways. And by the end of the day, my foot was just exhausted. Yeah. Right. Like going back to that analogy of the hand, it's like the literally the internal structures in my feet, the joint facets haven't been nourished with enough deformation from the environment. Yeah. For a long time. Um, I don't know. I think I'm just going on rants now, but, but some, but, but that's that complexity that I think is actually what makes a truly adaptive athlete, right? Herschel Walker running on, on weird environments all the time, making himself into the type of person who could run down an NFL field and adapt really well to it. And that yep. I think is what we're, well, that's what I'm after, you know, in, in, in preparing people. A hundred percent. Like, so that, uh, as you were talking about the, the trail running, effectively trail running, like rock running, you know, I'll, I'll say trail running because it's the easiest way to describe it. Um, I always prefer trail running because it's more engaging up here. Oh yeah. And, so you and I both, we, we look at movement as like enjoyment of the movement, of the problem solving, of completing the task, of not tripping and falling on the trail. 
and we're honestly like zoning in yeah. and so many people unfortunately want the fitness to be zoning out mm -hmm. like i just want to not think about it and just do the thing and that's that's what i mean all the way back first first thing i said romantic versus practical is that practical nature your wife just appreciates being able to go in this comfort place all of you are going together uh, it's a good family session it's easy it's it's warm it's comfort it's comfortable it's practical and the lines are set out she can say yeah the challenge i go from here to there yeah it's perfect and with a with the rock like it all fits within my, the my be able to be adaptable where be able is like sit on a recumbent bike and you have the cardio capacity that you've built and then you go on the elliptical and then you go and you get upright then you're on the treadmill then you're on the field then you're on a track then you're on the street with hills oh shit and then you're in the woods and now you're off the trail in the woods and you hope that you don't step on something wrong you know erroneously and bust your ankle or bruise your heel yeah. but it, it's just that spectrum uh, eventually you're playing tag or you're playing real sports um not trying to be the best at exercising like kenny powers would say still <laughs> how you you know that quote right oh i love that quote it's it is the best mockery of the fitness and strength and conditioning industry that has ever come out and the fact that it was motherfucking kenny powers ceo just so perfect it's uh it, it yeah i mean it's it's fantastic with one of the things i want to say with athletes you know i always i i like to own this right you train significantly more athletes than i do um when i went to and this and I'm bringing it back to the BA spectrum for me. When I'm running seven fit walls and we have 350 cl clients per studio, and I'm writing the same program for 2,400 people, and the program changes every three weeks, by and large, what, 90% of these folks or more, 95% of these people, like the only athletic, the only movement, the only thing that they're getting movement wise is coming to us. Mm -hmm. And so and they don't have aspirations really of doing other things. And so all the, the interesting discussion that we can have about like how much is too much bilateral and how much is too much stiffness, ultimately it almost doesn't matter for these folks because of the fact that they just aren't gonna go do it ever. Mm -hmm. um, short of there being a zombie apocalypse, like at that point, that's where we get into that weird discussion of risk reward where I'm like, do I even wanna build them up to this because they've had you know, 28 years of, of devolving uh, and becoming more brittle and not having tendon resiliency and ligament resiliency so that they do try to do elastic stuff, they might be more likely to be hurt because they basically have brittle structure. So maybe I have to just keep them in the be able bucket because the qualities of lower blood pressure, better cardiorespiratory health, better bone density by loading is actually more beneficial to them than the athletic. So it's, I mean, obviously it's just two wildly different mo uh, ends of the spectrum. You and I trying to like hold on to our athleticism as we start to get more grays in our beards. Yeah. Um, some of us, our beards looking good and some looking like I just lifted my pubic hair onto my face um, and then dabbled some, <laughs> some nair. Um, the, you just have, you know, that's the, that is part of, that is part of the romanticism that I was talking about with, with, with MoveNet and with a lot of the um, movement culture and, and like, to be honest, like Frank, Jason, I particularly love movement as play, as an adult concept, mm -hmm. but in having thousands of, like one of the cool things about having group is that you have thousands of exposures to people, what they're trying to get out of their exercise movement, yeah. uh, appreciation or or very rarely is it thinking of it as play yeah and it's unfortunate for them like i think they're missing out mm -hmm. but at the same time like i don't have the time to try to convince them otherwise um and so i'm like okay how do i make this as enjoyable and and dense and rich for them as i possibly can and that was always a task that i presented with myself i'm like i know they don't fucking care they don't want to do this they're not going to go take dance they're not going to take this as like they look at movement as something they have to do to get a health outcome, not as something they want to do for enjoyment. Somewhere they lost that, something they never had it, it's shame. But if I can make them enjoy what they're doing with me, even though it's fairly classical in the programming nature, um, 
maybe, maybe I can shift them and they start taking hikes and they start wanting to do other things. And so I want to be a gateway drug. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, you know, like I've been pretty negative towards the gym and the gym industry, but you sprain your ankle and you want to stay fit. Right. And yep. you discover that an elliptical machine is something that you can do before you can walk for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that treadmill is easier on my body. Like I, I could run on a true foam treadmill and get a good run in before I could run on flat ground. Totally. Hey, it's a tool, right? And the tool yep, has that's a it. Appropriate place in the toolkit. Like one thing that we've said for years is we want to train people at the higher, highest level of complexity that allows that adaptation that we're looking for. So yep. for me, uh, coming out of my ankle sprain, I was like, I needed to build my aerobic base up. Um, and I was like, the only tool that really worked for me at that stage was a treadmill. Yep. That was, that was a strange, strange place for me to be, but I was like, ah, that's, that's the thing that it is. Yeah. When we're looking at like, I think that, that we need to approach it kind of from two different places. Like one thing is like, people always ask me like, oh, this is your philosophy is amazing. This is awesome. I want to do this. How do I convince my mom? I'm like, don't. Yeah. Your mom's not ready. Right. If, if that's your first question, like, oh, you know, my, my brother is like, hates to be touched and he spends all of his time at a computer in his basement. How do I get him into this stuff? So don't start with him. Yeah. Find the one person who you know, who's almost there and convert them. Then there's yep. two. And then if there's, then there's three, then there's four. It's like you, you move out in concentric circles, find those people who are 90% of the way there and get them to take the next step. And then they'll help you convert the next set of people. So you can start, and that's that's what my brand is, right? It's like it's 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 aimed at the the 99th percentile of of movement people. From yeah, a, not, not from an ability level, but from a conceptual level. Yeah, interest and enjoyment. Interest and enjoyment. What you're talking about is how do we like people hate moving? They hate they exercise. Do. Right. And they hate exercise in part actually because they've poisoned themselves with food. Yeah. Right. Like, the, like th that was such a, this was like a black pill moment for me. It was like reading the studies that showed that children's energy expenditure goes down after, or their physical activity level goes down after gaining weight, not vice versa. So it's mm -hmm. not a thing of children primarily becoming sedentary and then becoming obese, they become obese, which drives them towards sedentary behavior because yeah. it's no longer rewarding or fun to engage in it. So it's just uncomfortable. It has to be uncomfortable. This mm -hmm. the biggest takeaway that I, I, I think it's the smartest thing I ever said was if you're a trainer, any workout that you do, anything that you do, just throw on 50 pounds, like throw on a, a, a body suit. And try to do shit with that on and see how enjoyable it is. Mm -hmm. One, it's a great audit for your workout. Because yeah. if, if you if you can't do it, they certainly can. Um, mm -hmm. but to for your point, yeah, if they little like little children, they get heavy, it's gonna be exhausting and uncomfortable and like you're not gonna be good at it. Like it's just of course it's going to <laughs> take it away. And then, you know, and I think we also have a huge problem with our the structuring of kids play like taking away unstructured play as literally punishing children for movement and that punishes those those reward circuits and that whole you know we're just taking that motivational frame out of a lot of kids lives because of the way that they're we're managing them through lack of recess through the way we're structuring pe and through through the reliance on structured sports for kids activity levels yeah but like at the most basic level in some sense to get people to be able to like, for me, the ultimately I believe that we have to actually recover our relationship with movement to recover our relationship with meaning in life, because every aspect of the self is rooted in movement. If you think about mm -hmm. how we initiate an understanding of our somatic and sensory and structural self, it's movement. Think about how we begin to interact with the world and understand what the world is like and it's movement. Think about how we begin to interact with other people. Again, it's movement. And those those connections are what gives meaning to life. So we need people to be able to recover that. And that's that's where I'm at, right? With, with with what I'm trying to do. But for a lot of people, that's not accessible because their experience of being in a body is so miserable. 
yeah on day one and a treadmill a kettlebell swing a booty camp and mm -hmm. just some basic dietary changes can absolutely be the thing that they need to get to the point where they can actually enjoy playing tennis right and develop some friendships from it and step yeah, in man. it's a it's a it's a wild thing that that's that's really where i don't and, and clearly like i don't have the answer like i've done the best i could with with fit wall with booty camp i mean the the the, the through line is hey it's got to be enjoyable when they come in um you know whether that be the inner the music banging mm -hmm. you know and or i have funny jokes or like i don't take myself too seriously um all those things are are so important like i think there's a whole a, a total totally good place for something like a movement lab or a move nat studio or a kettlebell studio in that probably attracts people that like those things and then those people go do the thing and as long as you can attract enough that's an awesome business because now you're just interacting with the people you want to interact with instead of feeling like you got to cut convince sons of bitches <laughs> that hey maybe this is a good idea yeah it's so it's so like it's a losing it's a frustratingly losing battle i always remember uh, rob wolf talking about on his podcast like he caught flack when he was just like how do i convince people he's like don't don't even bother trying like that just worry about the people that want help and help them and if you help if you worry about everybody else like you're just going to be worrying all the time mm -hmm. and fortunately i'm enough of an asshole to just not care <laughs> about everybody else that i don't know and like my care level has shrunk dramatically as as i had the voice so i'm like y'all take up a lot of my care energy uh it's similar to the, like how many fucks you have to give or how many shits you have to give i'm like i just like why it's immediate effect on me maybe it, i don't care if it sounds selfish it's just like it's the reality and so i like you know now at this point i'm like the the stuff that i'm putting out the business if i was to start my own facility it would be very much like the stuff that i think is important and enjoy and it would attract people that that resonates with and if it didn't i'd be like yeah go do something else then i don't care yeah yeah i was thinking like Folks like John Berardi may be a bigger part of the this the long term solution than than maybe I am, but uh, but like I can't be John Berardi. I'm gonna be me. Yeah, you. I mean, look, you're gonna be a bigger solution, a bigger help to maybe less total people, but that's that's okay. Um, you know, who knows? Berardi might be pissing people off with with some of it. Like he's gonna turn off people. You know, we always have. We can't get everybody. We just can't. And so I don't, I stopped worrying about it. A uh, long ass time ago. <laughs> well, I have a hard stop here in five minutes. So uh, this was super fun. Clef, thanks for joining me. Um, if folks are looking to come train with you, get involved in what you're doing, what should they know? Where should they go? IG, just Cliff and Harsky, okay. C L I F T O N H A R S K I. Uh, that has that has my link to my kettlebell program that we that I coach people on on Train Heroic. Um, and then I post stuff about fitness education. Um, there's a company I work with, Pain Free Performance, and you know we we I don't travel much anymore, luckily. But the coaches that we train to go and coach those do a do a great job with it. Um, that's it, man. I really appreciate being on. It's a uh, it's it's fun seeing. I it was not fun seeing your ankle injury. It's fun seeing you bounce back from it. Yeah, but yeah, um, <laughs> I did yeah man. What we'll what we'll the catch up outside of the podcast as well yeah let's do it let's do it uh i guess you're not traveling as much but uh you make it to the northwest come come play yeah yeah i will I, i'm gonna get pulled into a ninja competition with my wife i'm <laughs> at some point here <laughs> you gotta just start becoming a parkour athlete i was gonna ask you about that you do everything you know like all sorts of exploratory weird jumpies you're doing parkour with a kettlebell like you just gotta like admit what you're doing like, I know. I'm just soft. I'm scared. <laughs> well, I can help you with that. Uh, I'm good. We're very good at helping people with with overcoming fear. So, uh, you and Amy should come up and, and join us for a thing. I think you guys would really enjoy it. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I got to go, Cliff. Really appreciate you. Thanks, man. All right, man. Thank you. Bye -bye.